Let's pick up where we left the last discussion. It was meant to be a hot switch. It's not been quite as hot as we hoped, mainly because some people have, quite a lot of people have gone out. But um, Central Asia, everybody's ally. Um, I've certainly, uh, with some of the panelists, already been questioning what does ally mean? Is it ally or opportunity? And I don't really um, want in any way to impose upon any of uh, the panelists the, uh, the concept of ally. Maybe you would like to come up with something different. But I want to build particularly on the idea that um, there could be an ASEAN-like model for Central Asia um, to diversify relations with the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Now, it doesn't have to be only about that, but it is about uh, this concept, if we can uh, define it at the start as Central Asia, everybody's ally, everybody's opportunity, um, everybody's what? Let me try and push the envelope a bit on this. Um, Sadly, Micheline uh, Kameroy is not with us from Switzerland, but uh, Frederick Stark, let me just ask you, Fred, if you could start by um, shaking uh, the windows a little bit and giving us your view about whether we should be talking about allies, opportunities, or what, and what the status is in Central Asia at the moment. Well, first, with Mr. Oren Bayef here, I, d I defer to him. I I'm speaking as an outsider. And let me say a few things as an outsider. We are talking about five new states plus Afghanistan, which was really a new state now. Very fragile, all of them. And in a unique place in the world, surrounded by nuclear powers. There's no other place on the planet that is, in that sense, so profoundly dangerous. And these are new post-colonial states. Therefore, as all post-colonial states, whether it was the United States in the 18th century or, or Spanish colonies in the 19th century or Algeria in the 20th century, they are extremely defensive of their own sovereignty and, and cautious in their dealings with neighbors. This is a very very unusual situation. Now, what, what, what has been done with it? A new ASEAN, well, in several meetings here, in fact, uh, President Karzai earlier listed them. This is a region that is smothering, being smothered by organizations. Uh, there's no way that a leader in this region can keep up with all the member, uh, memberships they have. Their approach to life was, when you get an invitation for a new credit card, get them all. And, and frankly, this has brought real benefit. And some of these organizations, we know Shanghai and so on, the very significant Japanese, Japan plus Central Asia, all of these and the new European initiatives, ECO, an old and solid organization, all of these are important in their way. But it doesn't solve the problem for the countries themselves. That's the, the difficulty. And we're asking for a new ASEAN, maybe, but they have come up with their own strategy. And it's a very clever one. It was invented first by Foreign Minister of Kazakhstan, Takayev. It was simply to embrace all their major external powers that they deal with through a series of strategic partnerships. In other words, it's not against anyone, but balanced partnerships. They sit at the center of the web and, and balance these external forces on them in this very constructive way. Now, all the countries in the region have followed this today. This is the generic policy, and it's spread to the Caucasus as well. And it's very sensible. The problem if I may conclude with this as a, as, a, uh, as a question. The problem with this arrangement is that it requires certain modes of behavior from the external powers. And frankly, those modes of behavior are not always there. Some of them place very, it's very tempting to say this is our backyard. We have special prerogatives here, but everyone of them can say that because it's the nature of backyards that backyards come together. Now, 
The problem is first, therefore, that not all the external players acknowledge the same rules. And the second one is, frankly, they don't talk together. Uh, you have Shanghai, you have Japan, you have ECO, you have the European, you have the Americans, all of these having their separate claims on the region. They never talk to each other. So if you're sitting on the east side, you think Central Asia, greater Central Asia, faces Japan, faces Korea, it faces China, and that's the reality, whole reality. If you're in the West, you only think of the, of the connections westward. There's no contact among the external powers. So what I want to submit here is that the biggest diplomatic problem that the, uh, and, and if you will, economic problem that the, these fragile but rapidly and uh, I think impressively developing states have is that, they, that their friends don't talk to each other and haven't worked out their differences with each other. These are not differences with Central Asia, they're differences among their friends. Thank you, Fred. Uh, let's move on. Pierre Morel, uh, I'd like you to bring it down to earth a little bit in your uh, opening remarks and keep them uh, reasonably brief if you can about the impact and legacy that's been left from the, in the region from what happened in Georgia uh, back uh, in August. Well, of course, it has been quite, uh, quite a shock to all these countries in Central Asia. Uh, I would see several, several direct reactions. First, of shock and, uh, uh, well, disillusion, uh, shock because it was a conflict within CIS. And uh, there has been tension within CIS, but I mean, to come between uh, former Soviet Republic and, and Russia uh, to the point of uh, military uh, war activity, uh, military confrontation was quite a shock for them. And so their first reaction was uh, uh, to, to be uh, uh, very, to be negative and uh, say, show their understanding for the Russian reaction. Uh, second has been concern. Concern after the very rapid uh, and somewhat surprising uh, decision uh, from Russia to recognize the two uh, republics, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And quite symbolically, uh, these five Central Asian countries, which met just a few days, two days after recognition, vote of the Duma was 25th and was really uh, the starting uh, of the process because the actual recognition, the state act of recognition came on the 26th, the day after. And uh, two days later was the Shanghai Summit uh, Organization. Uh, that is the Shanghai uh, Corporation Organization, uh, quite an impressive uh, gathering of uh, countries uh, with, uh, I mean, between China, uh, uh, Russia and the uh, five Central Asian countries, that is four plus Turkmenistan invited, plus India, Pakistan, and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, quite an impressive uh, organization. And in the conclusions, uh, these uh, countries, uh, well, didn't want to enter into any reference to recognition. Because first and foremost, of course, China uh, resisted this idea because China is, uh, has a very clear position against what they call separatism. And when you look at the Shanghai organization, it was precisely targeting three evils, to use the uh, Chinese language, which is uh, terrorism, extremism, and separatism. And therefore, I mean, they, they mentioned there was a contradiction. And the, these Central Asian countries, therefore, abstained and uh, stressed this uh, reservation. Uh, more interesting even, uh, one week later, 4th of September, there was the CSTO, let's say the Russian NATO in a way, I mean, the Moscow-based security organization, and there was not anymore China there, but still, these uh, uh, countries abstained from any recognition of these two republics, showing, uh, therefore, this concern, which I think is a lasting one. Uh, because they are uh, complex in their own uh, composition in terms of uh, ethnic uh, diversity and so on. Third point as an outcome of uh, Georgia uh, crisis, I would say 
concern for the future and their links and precisely all this connection they have. You mean infrastructure, do you? Uh, both infrastructure and contacts with the, the outside world and, and be, be sure that, uh, well, there's not been now a new period of uh, caution where the partners would uh, hesitate to prepare projects, to enter into partnerships and so on. And so I think that's more or less uh, the, the mood uh, which has left them with uh, this concern. So you're talking about caution here. Uh, and when we, the word in the title of the, uh, the, the session is everybody's ally, an ally suggests a reliable partner or partnership. Mm. Are you suggesting there's now more caution and anxiety about the relationships in the region? Well, uh, I would uh, put this, uh, exactly the, uh, the, the other side. They are cautious and concerned, and therefore they will see value in uh, strengthening their links. Uh, with the different partners, knowing that there are question marks. I take one example, which is this famous debate on the Southern Corridor for energy. Uh, yes, uh, it, is, uh, it was unharmed, I would say, by the military events, and at the same time it was close to uh, this uh, Bakud, Bilisi, Chehan, and uh, both uh, uh, oil and gas uh, uh, link uh, to, uh, from uh, Baku to Turkey. Well, you can argue that now, I mean, this is under threat. What I would feel both from the, uh, I mean, from the governments, from the companies and from the experts is that yes, indeed, this Southern Corridor is more complicated, but is more important than ever. So contrary in what you could read here and there saying Nabucco is dead, I think it's an oversimplification. And that what you have seen in the past precisely in those links and multivectoral connections, uh, which, uh, let's say, Kazakhstan especially embodies, uh, the idea was let's, uh, the governments prepare the framework, uh, MOUs, agreements, contacts, meetings, and then let the company run. I think that now there's a wider understanding, both in the region as well as in Europe or in the West in general, that the governments will have to commit themselves more actively with the companies. They will, they will not replace the companies. This is what I would think is the, the new line for partnerships more than any alliance. Right. Partnerships is the right word, I think. Right, the view from the European Union. Let's go to the Asian Development Bank. I'm going to come to the politicians in a moment. Let's get the assessment uh, from outside. Um, Rajat Nag, as Managing uh, Director General, what is your checklist, your tick list, <coughs> Uh, as you look around Central Asia and the opportunities and your concerns? First, I think it's important to get back to the fundamental question of what's an ally. Now, to me, an ally does not have to be a buddy, but allies mean strategic partnership. And therefore, the first thing that we would look for is that a commitment from the leadership, is there a win-win possibility? And if there are the strategic synergies, then of course these partnerships will work. It has to be a win for both sides. It doesn't have to be the same amount, and I think political leaderships are always very pragmatic, but it cannot be a win-lose proposition. Therefore, I fully agree with what Professor Starr has been saying, that there is enough reasons for these countries to cooperate. There is enough enabling environment. I think the key thing is to make some of them happen. And I would take the point that Mr. Morel has made, that yes, while you get the overall structure right, the security being one of them, don't wait for the big picture to be all in place. Do some confidence building measures. Take a project, maybe the South Corridor, or whatever it might be. People want to see things on the ground for them to believe that cooperation is real. So for us, the important things, strategic leadership, commitment to that, and physical connectivity, small projects, uh, which can happen today. When you look at, again, this checklist, this tick list, uh, if you went through many of the countries in Central Asia, is there, by and large, a degree of homogeneity uh, when it comes to the judgments you will make as a bank? Yes, there is, and that's why, of course, we are very involved in the Central Asian Regional Economic Cooperation, be precisely because we find there are two things which are very important. There is a synergy and there is a convergence of interests, and there is strategic leadership being provided. Not all of us to the same extent, but the enabling environment is there, and we believe there is therefore a very positive environment for us to work in. 
Right, let's move on to the political perspective. Uh, Foreign Minister, uh, your view from uh, Turkey. Um, do you subscribe to the idea of everyone's ally? Uh, and secondly, do you see this uh, as a concept too far at the moment, the idea of an ASEAN-like model for Central Asian countries? Turkey and the Central Asian countries have special relationships. Why special? First, because uh, most of the people who live in Turkey right now have their origins from that area. T Turks moved to this region in the 11th century, and for most countries in Central Asia, we can still even understand each other to a certain extent, varying from one, one country to another. And from time to time, we have these Turkish-speaking countries summit, where Turkey and Central Asian countries come together at the, at the leaders' level. When they declared their independence, Turkey was the number one country, the very first country, to recognize their uh, independence before anyone, anyone else. And we had a period of uh, very heavy involvement at the political level, heavy involvement by our business people, by our NGOs. Right now, you will see many Turkish companies very active in many Central Asian countries. Uh, many investments, also construction business going on, and also many NGO activity, activity going on. Uh, when the, the recent crisis uh, happened in the Caucasus recently, uh, Turkey was in a natural position to step in and come up with a positive agenda over this platform idea, the Caucasus Stable 10 Cooperation Platform, which is now finding its base and, and now we are glad that all the five countries which we have taken this idea have, have accepted. Uh, on the other hand, the, 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 the approach from Europe to those countries some, from time to time has been too uh, much from the framework of we should reform them, we should, they should uh, take steps in terms of fundamental rights, freedoms, rule of law, democracy, and so forth. And, uh, and rather than trying to uh, approach them with a positive agenda, rather than trying to actually form stronger linkages and uh, relations and so forth, it was more of a uh, approach, too much of a cookie cutter approach, let's say, which probably was not the best way, way of doing it. Uh, and, and when we uh, look at the situation as of now, especially after new Russia emerged, so to say, uh, Russia is making quite strong inroads to many of those uh, countries because of their, their, of course, common history of, of years and years from the Soviet time, but also the fact that Russia is the official language in, in, in many of those. There is some percentage, varying percentage of Russian people living in, in the Central Asian countries and so forth. So uh, I think the, it is a fact that they will have varying amounts of special relationship with Russia as well. That's a reality which we also, also have to accept. Mm -hmm. Knowing that fact, knowing that reality, how to do complementary policies, how to approach the Central Asian countries to cooperate more with them, to uh, in a way accept them with their own circumstances, with their own uh, way of handling their uh, domestic affairs, but also find more areas of cooperation, find more areas of how to uh, in a way uh, be more in touch with them in many issues, including including trade and transportation and energy and, and many issues. Also, of course, try to also help them with their own domestic reform processes, uh, approaching them uh, not in a in a in a in a looking them from a from a high up here, but also cooperating with them in a in a more 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 uh, equal level, so to say. So. Uh, and, and also, especially the recent situation in, in the Caucasus made it more evident how important uh, to, to approach uh, the countries of the region with the right 
uh, with the right set of But let policies. me pick up what Professor Starr has said. I mean, yeah. it, it's my word, not yours. Uh, th there's a degree of dysfunctional relationship between many of these countries at the moment. Uh, they don't talk together, uh, no contact or limited contact. I mean, that was very forceful what you said. Now, you're being, you're being more positive about this and seeing the glass filling. Do you, do you subscribe to this kind of fragility or dysfunctionality that uh, has been mentioned? Well, uh, I, I, I strongly believe that a lot more can be done to strengthen the relationship uh, in the region. So the, the, the uh, relations between the countries in the Central Asia. Who does it? We, how, how does it get done? Surely it's bilateral then, isn't it? It's well, not an umbrella organization. Well, it, there might be other ways of doing it. There could be other ways of doing it. But then uh, helping them Doing their own is probably, again, the right way of approach, approaching it. How, how to uh, help them talk to each other more, how to, sort them, how to help them sort their differences. I mean, there are uh, feelings when we look at country by country, and sometimes we see tensions, sometimes just sour feelings about each other and so forth. Uh, actually, they have a lot in common. They have a lot to gain by sticking together more by coming up with more of a united approach to, to, to different, uh, different issues. Because if they are divided, if they have problems in between themselves, then at the end of the day, there is someone else coming and doing different deals, different uh, set of policies. So, just, be just, before yeah. we, just before we go to the Deputy Prime Minister, Rajat Nag, you wanted to come in. What I wanted to say was the last thing anybody needs, certainly this region, is an umbrella organization. And I fully agree with the Minister. There is enough momentum of bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral talks. Let's facilitate that. For heaven's sake, don't have an umbrella organization, You'll be just another bureaucracy. Deputy Prime Minister Orin Bayev, uh, your view about, uh, first of all, everybody's ally, but also the nature of what's happening in Central Asia. Uh, <clears throat> your question uh, has implicit assumption that uh, uh, countries should uh, uh, dominate uh, over another countries, or there is a choice between uh, selecting to whom to join or not to join. Uh, I think in the contemporary world, uh, uh, given the level of the uh, globalization, uh, situation is quite different. Uh, what, what I mean, how, how can you ignore Russia or United States or European Union? Uh, Georgia tried to do it, and we see the result. Uh, and uh, Professor Starr uh, mentioned uh, outside view of the uh, situation, how he assessed it. Uh, from my internal uh, assessment and approach, uh, I think uh, the countries uh, uh, within the Central Asia uh, should cooperate uh, and uh, uh, give more uh, development of their institutions. Uh, for example, uh, uh, our country suggesting creation of the uh, Central Asian uh, uh, Union. Uh, I think there are many obstacles to do it at the moment, but I think everyone can recognize that uh, future and the progress lies in this direction. Uh, and uh, regardless of the uh, obstacles we have at the moment, there is way to work out these problems. Uh, for example, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, uh, how can Kazakhstan uh, could be prosperous in Central Asia when uh, neighbors are weak and poor? They bring many problems, they, for example, migrants, uh, or crime, or, an, uh, or another uh, 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 social uh, problems with very significant uh, ramifications. Uh, and we promote uh, deep cooperation, and we want their development. And we have policies to uh, work with them, uh, to help, uh, there are many examples. One uh, specific example I can give uh, uh, in the light of this uh, uh, food security, which we uh, helped our neighbors. So this, I, I think uh, big countries also should uh, recognize these changes in the uh, real world, in the contemporary world, and change their values. Uh, in long term, uh, I believe uh, many uh, 
problems could be resolved uh, in this direction. How would you, de would you describe the state of bilateral relationships uh, as you look at it uh, from Astana and Almaty? Um, and this, particularly this point from uh, Professor Starr that really you're not talking enough together at the moment. Uh, that's exactly my point, that the big countries, uh, they have uh, old-fashioned philosophy and values. This is the problem of the big countries. Uh, and I think uh, there is uh, slowly uh, coming recognition that they should change their values, especially in the uh, uh, international field. Who are you pointing up? Who are you pointing to then? Uh, I'm not pointing specifically. <laughs> well, give me an country. idea of an example of what you're talking about. Uh, we've been discussing these issues at Duke with uh, Professor Starr many, many years ago. And uh, for example, my experience from the United States, I was personally really surprised how country uh, come up with the good policy, domestic policies, but, uh, and how they managed uh, to so many difficult issues which was in the country. Uh, and I had chance to see because uh, I, I lived there quite a lot time, uh, long time. But when it goes to international arena, it looks like that they forget everything and they just behave straightforward uh, without uh, uh, those experience they have actually in their uh, uh, domestic uh, policies. All right, well, please do pick up the conversation among yourselves. But Pierre Morel and uh, Fred Starr, you wanted to come in. I mean, I'll just uh, take an example since you wanted to, to, to target one precise example, uh, water. I think it has been discussed already today. Uh, very clearly, this is a major point. Uh, I think that among the security threats in the region in the coming years, I mean, the water uh, and, uh, well, let's say struggle for water can be very divisive uh, and at the same time is an opportunity, unescapable opportunity for cooperation. This is highly sensitive because you have uh, the upstream countries bringing uh, water to downstream countries and downstream means cotton, which cannot survive without uh, water, even if it's a rather painful heritage from the uh, Soviet period, which is part of the explanation for the quasi-death of the Aral Sea. So it's a very bitter experience. But today, availability of water is very important, and climate change is shrinking those together. So awareness of the need to work together, perhaps water is the best example. But we have been speaking of drugs. I mean, drugs is not a problem for one country, it is a problem for the whole region. And borders, uh, border control and organization of common fight against uh, drug trafficking, what we call the North Route, is absolutely crucial. And this is what we have learned with the EU working with Central Asian countries. Maybe first we came too much with the all-encompassing approach, because uh, as Europeans we start from the idea that regional approach, integration, is good per se. But because of their rather young experience and they want to affirm their identity, yes, we have to take account of their will to exist by their own. And we, we have put that experience together in our strategy for partnership in one word. We call it differentiation. That is, we must be able to talk to them as such and not try to fudge them into a one-size-fits-all. This is really the recipe for failure with <laughs> Central Asia. We learned that. Professor Stahl. Oh, there it is. What is an ally? An ally isn't someone merely with whom you have cordial relations, but there's mutual benefit to Only relations. cordial relations, isn't it more than that? Sir? Isn't it more than a cordial relationship? In, indeed, it must be. And, and uh, it's worth evaluating the, what are the various external countries bringing to this region? And some are bringing trade, some are bringing just power politics, some are bringing all sorts of projects. But I want to say, I think there, there is some uh, sobriety that's needed by, by a number of countries. And that is that the projects that they have devised, and this is also true for allied international organizations by the hundreds, are basically, I'm sorry to say this, talk. Uh, they are ineffective, they are a, a, it's a boon for the Toyota Land Cruiser industry. You're having overpaid staff doing nothing, holding meetings, and as, just having traveled all around the region, told by 
every country that what we're getting from these projects is blah, blah, blah. That was the exact phrase that was being used. Now, I would make an exception of the ADB's uh, uh, efforts uh, with opening trade and opening corridors of transport and communication to, to the South. I think this is something genuinely in innovative, but, but this is, this it seems to me is, is the problem that the, that the Western countries face, namely good intentions are not enough. They have to be, you have to deliver, you have to deliver not meetings and more meetings and reports and so on, but reality. And when that happens, then you'll have real alliances, uh, uh, a sense of being an ally and not just a lot of words. Foreign Minister, do you, t do you accept that? Well, uh, I not only agree, but also I would like to probably give some examples of what Turkey has been doing. But the, to, principle, to, the, the principle you, you find, you, uh, the principle with you does have traction. In other words, you accept what is essentially criticism. The principle, the principle of... Well, uh, what, what, what uh, Professor Starr has been saying. Yeah. Well, let me, let me say what we have been doing. Now, we have already uh, finished a project called Baku Tbilisi Jehan, BTC oil pipeline. This is to bring the Azeri oil through Georgia into Turkey to a Mediterranean port, port. We finished another project, BTE gas pipeline. Getting gas from Baku through Georgia into Turkey, connecting it to the grid so that in the future this grid can also provide gas to, to, to European Union as well. We have started already started the construction of BTK railway project, Baku Tbilisi Kars Railway. And it is also important because this railway, when we connected to Turkey, by the way, we just finished the tunnel underneath Bosphorus for the railway project, Marmaray, we call it. Uh, it is more than one kilometer of a tunnel underneath Bosphorus for a railroad. And the, the concrete is finished, the tunnel is finished. Now we are continuing with the technical work. So which means, and also think about the Transcaspian gas and oil pipelines, which are now also under project and also the china Aktau Railway project, which goes all the way to the Caspian Sea, and by ferries you can take trains across the Caspian Sea and connect it to Baku and then Turkey and so forth, which means connecting Central Asia to Europe through Turkey, we have three major projects, oil, gas, and railroad. And this railway, when it is completed, will mean that you will be able to get on the train in Shanghai, go all the way through Central Asia, through Turkey, and end up in London. I think that is going to be very important to make the Central Asian countries better connected to the Western world through these concrete projects. And we are doing it, of course, for ourselves, for Turkey. It is in our interest also, but also uh, to, to have a more of a Western orientation uh, for the countries uh, not only for their economic development, not only for uh, their uh, political connections, uh, but also uh, help those countries with their domestic reform uh, efforts uh, as well. And we are doing some, and we are ready to do more. And we are very happy about relations that we have in Kazakhstan, which is very strong, and with uh, Turkmenistan, with uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and so forth. So, and, and, and all these projects are bringing us together more and uh, more and more. But uh, Rajat, um, your point, of course, is no umbrella organization. Is there agreement on that? Because part of what we've been asked to discuss is about whether there could be an ASEAN type organization. Does anyone want to violently disagree with that? Before my colleagues agree that there should be an umbrella organization, let me <laughs> tell you that there'll be no agreement for a long time what that organization should be, even if we could agree that there should be one. Uh, therefore, well, shall we just check? Yeah. Let's, does, let's anyone, check. does anyone support this principle at the moment? Uh, you have one example which was uh, cited today exactly on water. You know, uh, the quarreling was going on. And finally, there was an agreement last uh, 18th of October. And it's quite interesting, because we, we thought it was somewhat hopeless. But at the same time, there's been a realization that next winter can be very hard for uh, the two countries of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, because 
there's been a very dry spring, the levels of the reservoirs are too low, and therefore, finally, they went, the five together, without the help of anybody, and they agreed for one year. And the two things are quite interesting. Right. You know, uh, there has been striking a good deal where everybody has something, a stake, but because they, these five countries, as they have their own idea and don't agree completely, it's a deal for one year. It's better than nothing. But it shows that coming to a real structure where they would say, because planning for water cooperation needs a generation in a sense. It's connected with electricity, with agriculture and so on. But for the time being, it's too early to come to a structured system. So it gives the impression that year by year, you find a compromise. That's the trend I feel now in Central Asia. Do you believe that deal of water will be prolonged beyond one year? I think it's a good example. But do, do you believe it will be? I, I think they will learn, and the bet is that they learn by themselves. We pass all the good advice. We can do things which are, sorry, Frederick, better than blah, blah. We are doing more than blah, blah, I think. But That's in the their end, view, not mine. Yes, well, when they want to, to, to be a bit uh, uh, stimulating for better help from us, and let's take the criticism. But I think that it's a good start because in the end, there's no good regional cooperation which is coming from outside. If or otherwise, want, it's imperialism. If you do want to join the conversation, I know you're spread around a bit, but please do get a microphone over here and anyone else, because we've only got about 20 minutes. We're enjoying talking to ourselves, but uh, you can be part of it too. Just hang on one moment, can you? Um, did you want to come back, Rajat? Uh, I see the two, the ultimate aspiration of an umbrella organization and doing things on the ground today, not mutually exclusive. And I think the point that Mr. Morel made is a good one, that the countries came together when they realized they had no choice. But I think the resources and the efforts should be devoted to specific projects. And that's what we're hearing today. And therefore, one lesson I want to share with you coming from Southeast Asia is that you need a lot of financial resources. And the same experience in EU. You need a lot of resources on the table. And resources will not be put by various taxpayers inside and outside the region unless they see progress. So therefore, get on with it. Get on with small projects, big projects, but you must show results. But have a long-term view. Don't think that you know, you'll do projects on a yearly basis, but you must take on projects along the lines that ministers also mentioned, which show people coming together, greater connectivity, transport corridors, which leads to greater trade, energy, water, and then you'll start to see a momentum of building it. Are you prepared to predict other pressure points which will lead to that kind of deal, maybe only for a year or a few months? Oh, there will be a tremendous pressure point on water because you've got in Central Asia two countries with a lot of water and other three without enough. And yet, if they trade, there is a potential win-win for both and for, for both sides. And if they don't trade, it can result in conflicts. And I think all these countries realize that cooperation pays and conflict doesn't. So, I, I, We came here to discuss, uh, you laid on the table the possibility of some kind of regional ASEAN, and that's been rejected. Uh, maybe we're, mo we're in agreement on another matter as well, namely that it would be highly beneficial if there was some kind of consultative body within the region that is made up only of regional states. Now, this did exist. Uh, it exists, existed several times uh, uh, in the 90s. Um, and and it, today, the presidents of both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have strongly called for it. There is a difference in focus because they want to make, there's real concern in some countries that the, any kind of regional union would not dilute sovereignty. It should be a consultative body, not something that merges sovereignties. But laying that aside, there is a will to do this. There is a problem, though, uh, and that is that uh, Russia has made clear to the regional countries that it will not allow the existence of regional organizations of which it is not a member. Now, China does not have that view. China is quite comfortable with 
they're coming together in a group of their own. Obviously, Japanese, Europeans, and Americans are too. I think that problem has to be overcome. Uh, if, if it is, then I believe there would be a regional organization fairly quickly. Well, let me check. Uh, Foreign Minister, you see the cable traffic. You have uh, contacts with your, um, with your opposite numbers in, in all these nations. Do you detect this kind of movement? Well, we, we, we don't really see such kind of an outcome in the short term. Could be later. because. Uh, we still need some time for some of the countries be more self-confident, more self-reliant, being able to uh, really uh, in, a, in, a, in a better mood, feeling strong enough so that they can come together with the others to take more of a joint effort, joint move. Uh, but for, 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 for the short term, we don't see the base ready, ready to do that. And Deputy One, Prime Minister Oren Bayev, do you, do you detect anything moving on that front? Uh, I agree with Professor. Uh, what example could be a really good example? Uh, and uh, if we uh, look to the long run, there is more a pro for this kind of the organization, I mean uh, Central Asian unit, rather than cons. Because uh, economy, uh, country is quite small. To develop and prosper, you need, you need to create uh, uh, one big market uh, in order to compete in the international markets, receive and get the uh, 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 results of the scale. Uh, and, and that means a lot of the things that should be uh, removed or fixed, like regulation, uh, labor regulation, uh, movements of the people, uh, investments regulation. So I think uh, there is very good uh, backgrounds, and I think these countries will be slowly realizing benefits of uh, unifying. Uh, but uh, I agree with the minister that it takes quite a long time. At the moment, because of the, uh, these countries just recently received independence, they are going through the period of uh, sovereignty. You know, it's like, uh, uh, receiving the freedom. Uh, but, okay, what will be in the 10 years? What they will do with freedom? Poor, freedom, and that's what, that's what, what uh, the final outcome. All right, well, let, let's see. Anything else we should have on the agenda, please? We've got about 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ahmet Erentok. I'm the chairman of uh, Azerbaijan-Turkey Businessmen Union and the vice president of Union of Black Sea Caspian Confederation of Enterprises. Uh, the uh, issue is, as you mentioned about the, 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 the roof organization, uh, after the Russia collapse, 13 organization has been established by the governments. The first volunteer organization which we have formed the end of 2006 as uh, 17 countries, which we represented the 460 million population. And uh, including Iran, Russia, Ukraine, I mean, up to Greece, Turkey, of course, Georgia, Azerbaijan. I mean, uh, it's a, I mean, a kind of white, uh, white organization. But the problem is, what I believe, as I can see uh, the participants, the ministers and the prime ministers, uh, this is not only the responsibility, the solving of the problem, not the responsibility of the government and the, and the, and the, and the country and the state, the business environment. NGOs should participate and work together with them. And this is the joint effort, how they say in Harvard Strategic Business Institute says that this uh, development needs to work together, academics, politicians, I mean the, the business environment and the, and the NGOs all together. I mean, we're not only uh, accept everything from the ministers, we're not only, only say something to them, and what are they doing, are they doing anything or do, we have to do something too. But what is our we being business, business environment, or let's say non-governmental organization? I mean, because we are the representative of the business uh, community. But what we have difficulties right now, as as UBCC, I'm the vice president of this uh, place in charge of entrepreneurship and innovation. I cannot find any NGO in Turkmenistan, for instance. 
Yesterday I was talking to Ahmed Çalık. I said, why don't you do something? Let's have one uh, organization from Turkmenistan. I can't find any organization in Uzbekistan, in Kyrgyzstan. I mean, the reason why, uh, this is my comment, and Kazakhstan also one of our vice presidents, Ata Meken, uh, Azat is uh, our vice president. I brought Kazakhstan to the uh, platform, which is very important. Reason why my, my comment is, uh, we need a proper support, and we are going to proper support to uh, our state and the government. We got to work together, and uh, we have to do proper joint effort together to development of the region. Uh, how we're working with uh, Fred Starr, he's my partner in, in one of the uh, program, and we're, we have seen too many development together, what we achieve. And uh, I believe that uh, this is the common effort. Everybody should put their finger under the stone together. Do you sense, Pierre Morel, that this is a growing pain which is really quite fundamental to the challenge we're discussing? Yes, I think it's, it's a good answer. And we should do more indeed in that direction. That is not uh, just government uh, to government. We have seen the limitations. We learned step by step. But, uh, for example, during the French presidency, we, we have organized and uh, uh, you were there, Minister Babachan, uh, security forum uh, in Paris uh, with the 27 member states of the European Union, the five foreign ministers of uh, Central Asia and the uh, uh, candidate countries, and therefore Turkey was there, and it was a very good signal, together with Shanghai Organization and so on. So we have done that in direction of security. We were thinking also, and it's not so easy to build, but a Euro-Central Asian business forum. This is lacking. We need that. And so let's hope that uh, the movement will be starting. Well, that how does it get example. established? Does it evolve by itself? Does it require personal initiative well, or what? Well, I think it, it needs uh, some initial support from business organization in Europe. For the time being, what we have is that it works well with energy companies. It works well with infrastructure uh, for big projects in connection with all the uh, development banks and so on and so on. But in terms of business group, uh, National Business Association, not so much. The other example I would give, and which has been starting, it is with universities. I take an example. There is a well-known European program which is called Tempus, relating uh, universities, that is, leading bodies of universities together. I take an example, Uzbekistan. 20 universities of Uzbekistan are now related to 100, 110 European universities throughout the European Union. This is not typically governmental. It, it has governmental money, EU money, but in the end they are doing their links. I could take the example started with NATO and which is now developing with the EU, what we call electronic silk highway. That is bringing uh, large band access to these countries to be able to use uh, better connections for internet in those countries. And believe me, the president of Turkmenistan has taken advantage uh, before he was president to be aware of that and he has facilitated the opening of the country to internet. I take this example as not being strictly governmental with some kind of benediction from authorities probably because you know association life in those countries is not completely easy all the time, let's be realistic, but there are openings and we must play on that level indeed. Rajat, uh, from the ADB's point of view, is that a, a role that you could play, encouraging this, if this kind of level of connectivity is needed? We, we do indeed, and, and I think that's an excellent point. And I think international organizations such as ourselves or EU have to play that facilitating role. I think my point really was that it has to still come within the region. The momentum has to come. We as outsiders can always facilitate, and we must be there for the long run. But the momentum must come from all parts of society, including business and civil society. Yes. Katinka Barish. Thank you very much. I have a question um, regarding the re regional economic integration. Um, you just alluded to the fact these are all small countries, they're all small markets, they can only survive if they integrate. Yet in the previous panel, it was mentioned that the integrating factor that what brings the region really together is energy. You don't need a single market for that. Um, water was mentioned, you don't need a single market for that. Given that most of the countries in this region seem to be specializing in commodity exports, can somebody please clarify for me, what is the big potential of economic integration in that region? Thank you. Fred. 
Well, it, trade and transport, and that can only happen with cooperation. Look, uh, I happen to have spent part of my life as an archaeologist. I can assure you that in the 9th, 10th century, the greatest cities in the world were in this region, including Afghanistan is, of course, part of it. Uh, this, this, was, this was the greatest generator of intellectual uh, power in the world in that period. And, and why was it? Because, it? because of the trade and transfer across it in every direction, not just uh, uh, east-west, but west-east, and, and uh, India to Middle East, and Middle East to India, and so forth. Now, what killed it? What killed it was, were, were very short-sighted tariffs. It wasn't the Mongol invasion. It was dumb tariffs that were erected by, frankly, very short-sighted local emirs and khans. And then, as that began, then the external powers simply lost interest. Oh, we'll invest elsewhere. We'll discover America. We'll get sea routes to Asia. And at that point, it was dead. So it seems to me, yes, you can, you can export uranium to Japan without a, a regional cooperation. You can, you can export cotton. You, they're the second biggest cotton producer in the world without cooperation. But if you want that great engine of continental trade to reopen, as the ADB has, has, has heroically uh, uh, championed for many years, if you want that to happen, there must be cooperation. Two caveats. Two caveats. It was well reminded in the session just before that one integration and uh, Silk Road is working, alas, it's drugs. And another caveat, which has been mentioned here and there, is what is connected with migrations. Yeah. Migrations is a big problem in this region, and we don't realize that enough. That is, the underdevelopment of some of these countries calls for big migration, for example, towards Russia. Half of uh, GNP, almost, of T Tajikistan comes from remittances. And uh, let's think of any possible impact and this is a question mark in view of the economic crisis of return of part of these migrant workers in their countries of origin. And in the end, I mean, migration works both ways. But let's think of this factor, which are both of integration, because transport is key. We can agree. But at the same time, if we don't, you don't have a good border management system, it means invasion and the north route of drugs uh, and the heroin uh, and HIV everywhere, which is now a concern in the region and didn't exist 15 years ago. And uh, when you think of migrations, the, the good balance and the good treatment of these populations, mixing uh, into uh, these different economic and shifting opportunities, all this is also a, a possible cause for trouble. In other words, opening and unlocking of these landlocked countries is essential, but at the same time, let's work with the governmental apparatus and the social programs so that this factor is taken also into consideration. Otherwise, I would see serious problems. Minister Babachan, can you uh, help enlighten the answer to, uh, uh, to that uh, critical question about the limits? Well, when we discuss these issues, I think it is also important to consider the Russian factor. Many ideas, many initiatives, which are coming from West, from European Union or elsewhere, can easily be perceived as, a, as, a, as an element of threat, I would say. So whatever ideas, whichever approaches or initiatives we come up with, uh, it is important to take the Russian Federation into account and not feel them threatened and also manage uh, the issue with a sense of complementarity, with, uh, not in competition, but a sense of complementarity. Uh, that is what we are finding missing in many of the, of the ideas, approaches that is coming from, uh, from the West, so-called. Uh, so, uh, more cooperation, more consultation with Russian Federation in policies regarding to the Central Asian countries is going to give better 
and more tangible results uh, compared to doing otherwise. I Rajat Nag. I just wanted to say I could not agree more with you, uh, Mr. Minister. I think that's a very, very important point that we think of regional cooperation, integration as what one calls open regionalism. It's not a fortress Central Asia. It's not a fortress Asia. It's really multi-track, multi-speed, cooperating with others and certainly not make it, as you said, Mr. Minister, quite rightly, a threat to anybody. It must be seen as a, as a positive. And I think that's a very important, necessary condition for successful regional cooperation.